And joining us now on the debate for the full hour, Patrick Yu, Anglican Bishop for the York Scarborough area, Glendon Thompson, Senior Pastor at Jarvis Street Baptist Church and President of the Toronto Baptist Seminary and Bible College, Jim Pankratz, Associate Professor of Religious Studies and Academic Dean of Conrad Grable University College at the University of Waterloo, and Kevin O'Neill, Assistant Professor in the Department for the Study of Religion at the University of Toronto. Hello to you all. I want you all to get comfortable because before we get going, I want to bring up some facts and figures to set the stage for our conversation. So here we go. Let's take a look at this. Let's look at where Christians have lived uh, over the past century. Back in 1910, Christians made up about 600 million people of the worldwide population. That was about 35%. A century later, in 2010, uh, that went up to 2.18 billion, a big jump in raw numbers, of course. But look at that. That's what surprised me. It's 32%, so not a big change. But what has changed is where Christians uh, are living around the world. So back in 1910, 82% uh, lived in the global north. And how that's defined is North America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan. Compare that to the global south, predominantly uh, sub-Saharan Africa and South America and Central America, 17.8%. A century later, this changes dramatically. In the global north, 39.2%. In the global south, 60.8% of people living in those areas are Christian. One more graphic for you. Let's bring that up. This is a map of the world showing countries by the largest religion by country. And there you can see all the different colors. This shows the largest religion in every country around the world in 1910. Christianity is in blue. Again, predominantly North and South America and Europe. Islam is in green. Ethno-religious faiths are in purple. Hinduism is in pink. And Buddhism is in orange. One more map here. This is uh, 2010. Again, the same map, but just a different year. Christianity is in blue. Take a note there. Look at Sub-Saharan Africa, how that has changed dramatically in the last century. Islam is in green. Ethno-religious groups in purple. Hinduism in pink. Buddhism is in orange. And agnostics, most uh, in the Asia region, the East Asia region, that is the agnostics there in some of the countries uh, that are the last communist countries in the world. Okay. There we go. We have the stage set. I want to go around the table. I want to begin with you, Patrick. I want to ask you to name a reason why Christianity is moving from the global north to the global south. Well, I would like to say that uh, some of the uh, missionaries have done the job right. And uh, they have done, you know, we have uh, in Anglicans called the five marks of mission, proclamation, discipleship, uh, helping people in need, uh, trying to change unjust society, uh, uh, systems of society and also uh, caring for the environment. And, and I think that they've done the first four pretty well. Okay, missionaries have done their work. Jim, what's the reason it's moving to the Global South? Uh, I would agree with what he said, but also I would add this, that once there wasn't as much of an emphasis from uh, outside, the, uh, that is from Western countries, from the Northern countries, this process of vernacularization or indigenization took place and is taking place all over the world. So local forms of music and expression and worship and social service. And that has really made the church dynamic. That's one of the reasons it's so varied. So it's dominant in the South, but it's got tremendous variations. And I think that's another one of the major reasons. Okay, Glendon, way in here. Why is it moving to the South? Well, Colin Brown wrote a book in England called The Death of Christian in Brit Britain, and he says that uh, Christianity died in Britain in 1963. And uh, it's very specific, yes, but uh, he, he looks at the moral revolution that took place in the 60s and says it's a, a vast factor in why Christianity is moving south. Kevin. I think these are really great reasons. I, as an anthropologist, would probably add that, and not at the level of causality, but democratization and expanse of market capitalism coordinates pretty well with these new forms of Christianity. The Pew Research Center, where those graphs came up from, uh, they use these terms, global, they're their terms, global north uh, and global south. Is Pew using good definitions here? I think Pew's using definitions that are exciting and that divide the world between north and south. And a lot of, I, I use Pew in my own research. Um, I think we have to question whether we want to divide the world, be it between east and west or north and south. What I think it does is, it invites a comparative approach, which I think a lot of people, and I think much of, of people talk about north versus the south, but um, that may quiet some of the relationships between what we're calling the north and what we're calling the south. Glenda, the biggest shift uh, is really uh, Christianity in sub-Saharan Africa. After centuries of missionaries in Africa, why are Africans becoming Christians now? Well, it has always seemed that Christianity has done well in difficult and thrived in difficult environment. 
Uh, but I think that when you look at Christianity, that the message of Christianity is an appealing and an ennobling message. Uh, first of all, it values the individual, places great emphasis on you as a person, your worth, your value in the eyes of God. And secondly, it, it, it purports to, to give a message of hope. And it, it tells us that we need God and that God loves us and that if we repent of our sins and believe in Christ, we will be saved. That, that message is incredibly encouraging. And in, in a world where there is great difficulty, you can understand how that will resonate. Why is it resonating, Jim, in the parts of the world that you study? You look, you look at India mostly. Is it that message of hope? I think it is, because one of the things that's characteristic of the, of the church in many, many parts of the world is that it starts with the marginalized. Uh, just to give you an example, in the research that I've done in India, it's often among the outcasts, it's often among the lepers, it's among orphans, uh, those kinds of people. And so on one hand, one can push it back and say, well, yeah, those are the weak people of society. Um, of course, they would turn to something else. But the point is that's part of the message of Christianity, that it is for the people on the edge, for the people who are marginalized. And the church proves its authenticity by, in fact, caring about them. And so in many, many parts of the world, that's where the church has begun, at the margins. And at the center of religions is often, whether in Christianity or other religions, at the center is where things are often held very tight. At the margins, there's more fluidity, and I think that's why the church often attracts people at the margins as well. Patrick, how do you feel about this? Because I, I, I take Jim's point, but, but really, I mean, there is something that's swelling now, and I'm trying to get to the nub of that. Why are we seeing this now? Well, I, I think that uh, I want to agree with Glendon. I mean, I think that, you know, as, as a Christian, I would like to, to, to think that this, uh, God has something to do with it. And I also want to, say, to think that the message has something to do with it. But I, 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 I uh, hark back to a speech that um, I heard from, oh, I uh, forgot, forgot his name. I, uh, but uh, it talks about the kind of uh, religion that we practice uh, after the Reformation are actually very appealing to countries that are in the process of nation building. Uh, and uh, so what um, uh, I think that the, 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 the Christians has, I think through unfortunately colonialism, uh, has taken part in uh, the providing hospitals and schools. And I think that uh, that is seen actually uh, as a, something that's very useful for the nation. Uh, I think that, that the, a lot of places are still in the process of nation building, and I, I think I, I include China in, in all of that. And I think that uh, historically, that is when Christians have done well, even in the West. You it won't come as a surprise to four gentlemen sitting around the table, and I want to ask uh, you, Kevin, about yeah. the role of women uh, in these growing Christian societies. Is there a place, or are they embracing Christianity, or is this a male-dominated sort of approach? Well, the, the research seems to be to have some consensus that, and probably too much consensus, that it's um, kind of a, a female upsurge of faith. Um, but, I mean, leadership tends to be male in terms of leading large congregations, even small ones. But that the going consensus is that women drive membership or at least um, attendance in the church services themselves. So the question is, um, in terms of leadership, is it, is it like really a place for women in terms of uh, pastoring and then in terms of attending the services? Or do men participate as much as women? I would think. Jim, what about in your church, the Mennonite Church? Are we seeing women play an active role in, in the global south as the church grows? Yes, there's actually a very dramatic story in, in Ethiopia during the communist regime of about, about 10 years. The, the men who were seen as leaders were imprisoned. And when that regime was... Uh, uh, overturned and those leaders came out they found a church that was much larger than what they had left behind before and much of it had happened through the work of women and other people who hadn't had prominent leadership in the church so Ethiopia is a, is a very strong example of you can put the male leaders aside and there still is a kind of spiritual vitality there and that led to an enormous growth and more than doubling of the church within those period of 10 years. Patrick what about in China? Well, I, I actually only know about the Anglican world, but in China, the former president of the China Christian Council is a woman. Uh, and I think in the Anglican world, it is completely uh, mixed. Uh, I just came back from Kenya, and uh, they ordain women. Uh, but I think that in some parts of, uh, of, of Africa, they do not ordain women. So uh, 
Kenya, which in my view is, is a very conservative uh, uh, Anglican communion, was seen by some of them as sort of way liberal, which is really amusing for me. <laughs> uh, but of course, uh, I think that uh, it is not a north-south thing. I mean, I think uh, Great Britain still have some great difficulties have having women bishops. Glenn, this shift that we're seeing in the world, this, this move to the south, is there a reason to believe that this trend is going to continue? I think the discussion on the movement of Christianity is a difficult discussion because there is underlining all of this. Uh, a huge aspect of it relates to the supernatural. And uh, this has already been alluded to. We can only see this phenomenologically. We can only describe Christianity in that sense as we see it appear. But it doesn't mean that we have gotten to the nub of the issue. We believe that, that where Christianity goes does not just rely on social factors or even economic factors, but that it is supernatural, so that God is at work in different parts of the world. And because it has gone to the south, it doesn't mean it's going to be there in the next 25, 50 years. It may shift and find itself, for example, in North America or in Europe again. Divine intervention, or is there something more at work here? As an anthropologist, I'd say there's something more at work. I mean, I, I think with... Uh, you know, social and cultural dimensions are, are significant with its growth. Uh, when we're talking about charismatic and Pentecostal Christianity in places like Latin America and Africa. Um, and I think in terms of it, its inevitable growth, there, there will be some saturation point. I think we can expect a slowing down. In Guatemala, so uh, the Pew suggests that Guatemala is, is where I do most of my research, is 60% Pentecostal or charismatic Christian. It was one time overwhelmingly Roman Catholic. Uh, and there was great excitement within the different communities in Guatemala itself that it would reach 100% Pentecostal charismatic by 2020, and then it was 2050. The growth has slowed down for understandable reasons. When does the broader world hit the saturation point? Do you have a sense of that? I have no sense of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll wait and see. Right. You know what surprised me was that first graph that we talked about. I guess anecdotally or somehow, I just assumed that Christianity had declined as a percentage in the world, and Islam was, it was the religion that was really surging. That's not the case. And I'm wondering, Jim, why do you think North Americans have missed this trend? Well, probably we, like almost anybody in the world, is very much centered on their own perspective and sees the world that way. Uh, we can't help if we look around, we see churches for sale. Um, we hear of churches closing, or we hear of um, churches being so small that three of them combine and have one pastor, and, and we hear a lot of that. Um, we go to churches, we find them, some of them are not very full, some of course are thriving. But one of the things we don't notice as much is that a lot of those church buildings are nowadays being bought by new immigrant groups who are Christian. Uh, in, in my own Mennonite community, we worship on Sunday morning in 12 different languages here in Ontario. Languages I won't get you to list them all, but give me a couple. Well, well uh, for example, Burma's in the news these days. The Chin people, where there's a lot of ch challenges in Burma right now, are a group of people in southwestern Ontario. Um, they have congregations. They visit back and forth to the Chin in Burma. And that goes on to people from Laos and from Vietnam, from Ethiopia, from Central America. And so a lot of these places that look as though they're being vacated are often now being used by people who represent the larger global church. And that's a huge phenomenon, not only in our denomination. It's, it's a phenomenon across, I'm, I'm sure uh, Patrick would say exactly the I same thing. I can see thing. you nodding your head oh, there. Oh, yes, well, I, I mean, I can add uh, Tamil, even in my own area, Tamil Chinese, uh, Cantonese and Mandarin, uh, Spanish, um, uh, Tagalog in the Philippines, and, and, and others. I, I can't even, you know, list them. Yeah. Uh, Kevin, you know, whenever Christianity has expanded historically uh, in, into a region, it's changed. So Christianity as a Jewish sect was different than Christianity. The Romans, obviously. How is Southern Christianity uh, different from, let's say, the traditional Canadian Christianity, if we can call it that? The traditional Canadian. Um, I can't speak too much <laughs> to the traditional Canadian. I, I'm new to Canada. But um, I, think, I think what would excite us all in terms of so sociologists, historians, anthropologists is that there is both with Pentecostal charismatic Christianity, that, as you mentioned, that ability to be kind of um, local, or this local man manifestations of Christianity, but there's also something familiar, so we can speak about a global Christianity. Um, what specifically, was, the question was what specifically? Yeah, well, how, when I walk into a church oh, is, in the global south, how does Christianity look different there than when I walk into a church here in Toronto? Well, I think, I think some of the, the performance of it, I mean, if we talk about Pentecostal charismatic, it's, it's usually a much more theatrical event. Um, so if we have a two-hour service, and I can speak specifically to the Guatemalan context, and the first hour would be lively music um, that sounds much like the pop music you would hear on, on the radio, followed by a pretty charismatic um, sermon. 
So I think even just the experience and the theatrical dimension is, is something very different. You talk about something called spiritual warfare. Tell me what that is. I do. I write, write a bit about spiritual warfare, and it's nothing new to the Christian tradition. Uh, it's a biblical sense of the world divided by uh, the material and the spiritual, and, it's, um, and that the two worlds are in some ways connected by demonic forces, and it's the responsibility of the active Christian to war against these demons that they perceive uh, in the world. It's a very popular um, and very vivid experience for Pentecostal and Charismatic Christians in Latin America and Africa and so on. And, um, and, and the stakes are very high for those who are participating in what's known as spiritual warfare. Okay, I think we have a, a guest on the line from Regina, Saskatchewan. John Meehan, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, John Meehan, let me introduce you. You're a Jesuit priest and assistant professor of Catholic studies at the University of Regina's Campion College. I know you've been able to right. listen into the conversation so far. We haven't been able to talk to you until now, but uh, tell me uh, what you make of the discussion you've heard so far. Well, I, I agree with the uh, points that have been raised. Uh, the only one I'd like to add is uh, I also teach history. And so I think history gives us a different perspective on the Christian experience in the global south. And as one of your guests commented, uh, this legacy of colonialism, uh, which, the not, which the global south is now breaking from. And I think that's a very exciting thing, certainly in the Catholic Church and in all the churches, is that they're moving away from this colonial legacy. And that's, uh, I think that's going to transform the entire church. You uh, focus particularly uh, on China. Tell me how the church is changing in China. Well, uh, from the Catholic point of view, it's extremely complicated and very sensitive at the moment. Um, because, as you might know, and as some of your viewers might know, we have the officially approved patriotic church uh, that has about 6, 000, 6 million members, and then the underground churches, which are not uh, under the government uh, department, and we don't actually know the exact uh, numbers in terms of how many members belong to that church. So um, these, these differences between official and underground church now are, uh, and some would say, are meaning less and less. Uh, the Vatican's going very carefully carefully not to alienate any of these Catholics and to bring them all into the fold as it were. Okay, I want to go back to a question I asked you, Jim, that, that we were talking about, which is when I walk into a Mennonite church in the Global South, how does it look different from a Mennonite church here in Canada? Well, it would depend on where you walked into a church. Uh, let me just give you an example. We have every about six, seven years, we have Mennonite World Conference Global Assemblies where people get together. We're a relatively small group in the whole world. 1.6 million people call themselves part of the Mennonite Church family. So in 1990, that happened in, in Winnipeg. So it, it looked a lot like what you would have in Winnipeg, except there was a, a bit more variety to the music. The next one was in Calcutta. Well, in Calcutta, um, they used a lot of Indian forms in, in, the, in the worship and in the in the way food was served and all that. The next one was in Zimbabwe. And then the one we had uh, just a couple of years ago was in Paraguay. Each one of those looked different. So uh, to go with what was said before, I don't think we can generalize the global south into one category. India, Zimbabwe, Paraguay, those are really very different places and they're very different from Winnipeg. And yet there's this marvelous, miraculous sense of being part of one family. Do you see that, Patrick, as well? I, I, not to generalize, but I, when I walk into an Anglican church in the global north, what is the difference? It may be in terms of how they worship or the practice or their beliefs. How is it different? Well, I'm going to give you some live examples. I think that the one thing that I want to qualify from your question is that is there a traditional global north form? I think that we are doing our own enculturation, we're doing our own adaptation. So I think that in my area, for example, you go to one uh, Anglican church, you have uh, the whole thing chanted, and incense and everything, and another one would be clapping and uh, raising the hand. So I think that there, there's, we are doing that. But uh, I, 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 was, I was asked to uh, preach in the church in Kenya. In the morning service, uh, the, the priest tells me, says, don't preach for too long because uh, uh, they, they, they like the old form. So it's a 1662 prayer book, which is even, oh, even for me. And, uh, you know, very, very, very friendly, but uh, short, traditional. And the later service, there is half an hour of singing and clapping, and everything is on PowerPoint. So, <laughs> so I think that uh, indigenization is very important. But I, I do want to say that there is a vitality in the church that I visited in Malaysia, in uh, Kenya, in China, that uh, sometimes I wish we, we could have in the, in the north. John, go ahead. I can see you saying agreeing there. Yeah, no, I, I just agree with what uh, Bishop Yu said. Uh, when I took my students to China in May, we went to several churches, Catholic and Protestant, and what struck me, to get to your question, what's different, how full they were, 
how many young people and in the churches I visited they actually had television screens outside for the overflow so people are actually outside uh, of the church watching the mass participating in the mass you know via the tele television screen so there's, there's just a dynamism there the young people uh, men and women uh, children uh, that I don't see oftentimes here in the global north but John, we also see in, in the global north, again, using generalizations to talk about it, but the focus on issues uh, of a more moral sense, if I can put it, that things like sex and sin and homosexuality, which mm -hmm. is a big issue in many churches. Do Southern Christians have the same focus? I think there, uh, it's not to say they're not issues in the South, but the list of priorities are, are different. Uh, uh, the Christians in the South generally are looking at issues of, of survival, uh, of debt relief, of um, environmental uh, devastation. Uh, these are the things that rank high on their list of priorities. And I think um, in the church, one great thing is that we can talk to each other across these divides between North and South and East and West and realize that our concerns are not always their concerns and vice versa, but how can we approach some of these issues together? Uh, Kevin, you talked about the, the Pentecostal, the charismatic church in South America, quite different. I mean. Christianity has been practiced in South America for centuries, but, sure. it, but it is evolving and changing. Um, are the churches there, they're sort of adopting a southern U.S. American sort of political vibe? Is that yes. what's happening there? No, and I think, at least in my research, there's great connection between uh, U.S. neo-Pentecostalism or Pentecostal charismatic mega churches and the kind of churches that are coming up in Guatemala who are becoming politically influential. And to get back to the kind of moralities and and main topics that, that you mentioned earlier and the distance between or difference between North and South. Um, in Guatemala with these mega churches that are actually architecturally similar to those found in the U.S. South and the pastors train in the U.S. and, and so there's a great connection. Some of the main hot button topics in the U.S. like abortion and gay marriage aren't really legible in Guatemala because abortion and gay marriage aren't culturally significant so the churches don't weigh in on them. But as mentioned earlier questions like democratization or, or the national, creating a national sense of citizenship is a real significant issue. Glenn, do you think there's a problem, an issue with having different conversations within the same church in different parts of the world? No, I, I think that for us as Baptists, the, we have a core belief on some essentials. We believe essentially that God is one. We believe salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We have some core beliefs. And in every context, there are certain social pressures that will allow, will force the church to respond to those issues. Uh, I know that, for example, in Africa, poverty is a big issue, and the church rallies around that. It may not be the same issues that we are rallying around here in Canada or in the States. And so it will be the dynamics on the ground in a particular locality that will, will see the church respond. But in terms of its core beliefs, there are, as evangelicals, a center around which we revolve. Patrick, you know I'm coming to you next because the Anglican Church, of course, has been making all kinds of news because of the discussion over, or over homosexuality and, uh, and allowing uh, people to practice and lead churches in that way. I mean, is that, a, the, that same conversation going on in the global south where Anglican churches are, to the extent that it's going on in North America and Europe, at least? I think one of my colleagues have, have once said uh, uh, to me, he says, you know, uh, we, we are dealing with context. It is uh, impossible to preach the gospel in the global south if you're sympathetic to homosexuals. Whereas in the north, it is almost impossible to preach the gospel if you're not, mm. you know. Catch so I think, I think that's a catch-22. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, in, in our church, we really have many things going on. I think that, that uh, uh, well, let me list a couple. Uh, I think one is, uh, I, I think my, one of my uh, former colleagues in Hong Kong says, uh, a lot of it is actually the Americans trying to export the internal cultural war to the rest of the world, and we ought not to let them do it. Uh, I think another thing that's going on is that I think that the, the global south, because of a numerical strength, and I would also say spiritual strength, wants to claim more of a leadership in the world Christianity than it's, uh, it's, it's has been the, the, the case. So I think that, that sometimes they're impatient. They want to say, you know, we don't want to talk to you. But I think that um, we have, have some public uh, spiffs in, in uh, but I think that right now there's also uh, a lot of conversations uh, informally. Uh, and I think the Dice of Toronto is actually playing quite an important part. Uh, we have um, uh, been leading a kind of conversation, uh, not sort of official, official, but, uh, but also sort of in, inviting people. We had some conversation in Africa last year, and I think they are all coming to Toronto uh, next year. I want to 
parse something that you just said a little bit further. Jim, I'm going to ask you to pick, the, pick up from there. Patrick, you just said that there's a sort of new colonialism in terms of the, the global north wanting to impose our kinds of, of values and beliefs and, and religion on the global south. Are you seeing that? And if so, how dangerous is that? Well, I think it's, it's always true for, for people who have power. Uh, this is a natural impulse to assume that what's successful in one place or what's a core issue is a core issue for other people. And one of the advantages of really having a global church is that we begin to listen to each other and hear that there are other issues that we might not have thought of. Uh, if I can just give an example, right now there are many places in the world where Christians are being killed because they're Christian. They're being killed in Iraq. I mean, you just have to follow the news. Churches are bombed and, and so on. And in other parts of the world, this is true. Uh, Christians are emigrating out of various countries because of the persecution of Christians. In our church, we, in our local church, we have a particular uh, connection to the Eastern Congo where there's been huge violence against women. And, and so I think the connection of the church, uh, the globalization of the church has the advantage of making us aware that there are issues that we don't face. And if we listen sensitively to them, we can be influenced and shaped by those and not always imposing our agenda on the rest of the church. Because for people who are, are just you know, in danger of their life, uh, some of these questions will seem to them to be very, very distant. They're not nearly as immediate. And that's, by the way, shaping our churches here in North America because many of these churches who are fleeing persecution, of course, establish themselves as refugees here, and then they shape the character of, of the church in North America. John, what are you seeing? Is there this great disconnect? I, I, you know, I'm, I like the way this conversation is going because... Good. What it, does, what it says to me is, uh, well, just, uh, just uh, you're doing a great job, Peter. Um, no, Thanks, I'll send the check later. <laughs> yeah, Go send ahead. the check later. Uh, no, I just want to say, emphasize this aspect of conversation. I mean, we have rifts in the churches. We have, it was Catholic, Protestant, North, South, East, and West. What matters for me is, do we have those channels, those forms for communication, for conversation, where Christians, Catholic and Protestant Orthodox can get together and pray together, can talk together. Just to give you an image, if we talk about the global village, it would be as if we had all of these Christians in one village and the global north, they're the people in the rich parish. And the people in the global south are the ones in the poorer parishes. And as we know from experience, people in a wealthy parish who don't get out of that parish are going to have a very narrow perspective on things. And uh, vice versa, same with the people in the poorer parish. This is why uh, these groups have to talk with each other or else we get wrapped up in our own concerns. And I think that's, that's one of the important um, benefits, I think, of the universal wider church. Uh, and we have to have structures for conversation, communication, com communal prayer, etc. But I guess so the that, question, uh, John, is, is are we doing a good job at that? It's not easy. It's not, I mean, as, 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 a, as a human race, are we doing a good job at that? The uh, United Nations is a relatively new institution you know, in the last 60 years or so. So these things uh, t are taking a, t taking a while. Uh, they are occurring. Uh, uh, in my own Roman Catholic Church, we do have synods. We do have international meetings. Um, it's happening. And, uh, you know, in, again, in the Roman Catholic Church, um, the people in the global north make up only 34% of the church. So we're a majority southern church. And it's going to take a while for that to filter into the leadership uh, positions and uh, but I, I do see the communication happening. I was in Rome three years ago for the African Synod, and just to see uh, representatives of the African Catholic Church present in Rome and feeling the impact that they're having on policies that matter to them, and then the other non-Africans listening to what those issues are. I think that's a very important step forward. Jim, you're nodding your head. Well, well, I certainly am, but it was interesting at the percentage that he was just quoting. That's almost exactly the percentage split uh, for, for Mennonites globally, and people would think of them as being sort of a Waterloo County, Pennsylvania, or, or Asia, or, or European group, and it's almost exactly the same. It's about 34, 35% would be Europe and North America, and the others are, um, are around the world, in, in other parts of the world, and in various different cultures, often relatively new, in the last hundred years perhaps, but all of that's affecting the shape of the church and the global conversations. That's very, very important. Patrick, your church, the Anglican Church, is, is confronting this issue almost directly in terms of the head of the church. The Archbishop Canterbury is resigning. Uh, the front runner, I guess, to replace him is, is someone from Africa, if I'm not From Uganda. Right. Yes, yes. Is the Global North, is the congregation of the Global North going to accept uh, someone from the South sort of coming in and, and talking about issues that they might not see as pertinent or as relevant to their daily lives in a religious sense? 
Uh, I, I'm not sure that, that that is necessarily the case. I think that the, the Archbishop of Canterbury is a very complicated job. I think that <laughs> it's probably the most challenging <laughs> job in our whole communion uh, because uh, 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 at this moment has to be he. So he, he has a, a, an establishment role in the Church of England. So it cannot actually be somebody outside the, uh, uh, the, the English establishment. But of course, uh, uh, Archbishop Sentimu is a British citizen. Sentimu? Sentimu okay. is, uh, yes. So he, uh, now I, 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 I'm, I, I don't have the uh, uh, inside information that you have. I'm not sure that he's a front learner, but uh, he I, I'm is. I'm just telling you what I'm reading. Yes, 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 yes. right, right, right. Um, so I, I would imagine that he would have the sensibilities of both the uh, English church and the global church in mind. Uh, Glendon, are you seeing uh, similar trends in the Baptist community? I mean, you talked about the Baptists having this core message that resonates throughout the world, but is there this disconnect between uh, the Baptist groupings around the world? Well, I, th I think that in the past, of course, missionaries were the ones who took the gospel to Africa and to Asia. And when the gospel goes, it goes with some cultural baggage. The way you organize worship, for example, in the north is replicated to some extent in the south. But you also see that the south begin to exert its own independence in terms of worship. If you go to a Baptist church today, you probably will spend an hour and a half for worship. You go to a Baptist church in some parts of Ethiopia or other parts of Africa, that may last for five hours. And so there are significant differences, and we've got to understand that, that there are different dynamics taking place. Uh, the church in, say, Ethiopia, for example, uh, views worship as entertainment, as everything, right? That's where families come together, where friends get together. So it's worship, whereas here we, we worship and then we go about our own businesses. But I think that when you come to wh who we are as a community, as a, as a group, we believe in the autonomy of the local church. We believe also that uh, scripture is the center. And so we have this core message in which we are. So we are, there are divisions, there are theological divisions, but by and large, there's a core set of beliefs in which we hold the primacy of scripture, the supremacy of God and Jesus Christ. These are the things that bind us together. And so whether we are north or south, when we meet one another, we do know we're on the same page where it concerns the basic outline of theology. Yeah, I want to I add that uh, uh, those are also, I think those are universal Christian beliefs as well. They're, they're not just Baptist beliefs. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I want to draw your attention to a couple of things, actually. I think that uh, uh, Glenn said that in 1963, uh, the church died in England. Uh, I've heard a similar thing, but it's not to do with the decline of morality, but the Ed Sullivan show. Uh, and I think when, when that happened, uh, e evening worship goes. And, and so I think that as, 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 the, um, the, as churches in the Global South gets more into their uh, 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 journey of nation building and modernization, that uh, plate would hopefully be more full and they have to navigate their own uh, path as to the role that Christian uh, religion plays in their own culture. Uh, Kevin, when we look at Pentecostals, though, they have a number of smaller churches. This is, there isn't sort of this big overarching thing. I mean, sure. is it sort of one big happy family, or is there risks to all this diversity amongst uh, the different groups? Well, it's definitely, I mean, Pentecostalism as, a, as an umbrella term is a really loose term. I mean, that, that encompasses a number of self-identifying mainline Protestants, who maybe self-identify as Pentecostal, Pentecostal charismatic or non-denominational non churches. Um, and so I don't see as much unity uh, within, for example, Latin America, and I actually see a lot of, with the ministers and the pastors that I speak with, a lot of concern about marshalling kind of uh, more unity between the congregations. And so one of the, the catchphrases that I follow often is this commitment towards leadership, church leadership, and it's, it's this recurring theme. And I, I always wonder if the church is trying to develop so many leaders, I, I don't know who's following. There's, there's <laughs> all these multiple directions. Um, so I do, I do wonder whether there is as tight of a, a, a central message as, as we sometimes think. And, and do you see that playing out in terms of churches dividing and, and there being some kind of conflict? Sure, uh, dividing and competing. I mean, it's, so we talked about language of saturation or whether, for example, Guatemala could grow in its, in its Christian affiliation. Uh, yeah, you see, you see churches dividing, you see churches coming together, you see churches competing for similar demographics, absolutely. And, and yet Pentecostalism is so popular in Africa and Latin America. Absolutely. What's at the nub of that? Well, I think, I think it returns to some of the, the themes that we talked about earlier about aspiration and hope. These are very aspirational and hopeful uh, messages, uh, whether it's a question of salvation or national renovation or simply getting yourself out of credit card debt. This is a very 
aspirational and entertaining. Language. It is really, as an anthropologist who spends a lot of time in Pentecostal context, it's very entertaining. Just a comment about that, though. Uh, there are also a whole range of phenomena in our world, which in Africa used to be called African independent churches. Now they often use different, uh, now they often talk about indigenous churches. These are movements which have, have started by having a contact with Christianity in some way, but then have very, very distinctive forms to them. And those just multiplied. I mean, there might be 5,000 different groups like this, or my number might even be small, in Africa right now. And so, again, that relationship to sort of what you might call mainstream Christianity is sometimes very complicated. Sometimes it's very cordial. These groups in relation to each other, they often follow prophets and individual teachers or healers. Healing is very, very large in many parts of the world. And so uh, they can be one congregation or they can be a combination of congregations which make up 18 million people. But that's a whole other phenomena in many, many parts of the world, which is incredibly creative and dynamic, but very complex. The healing aspect of all this is important as it plays out in the in the global south, isn't it, Patrick? Indeed, I, I think that uh, I, I learned from a, a native spiritual leader in Toronto. He said, you know, you have to realize that our people didn't go through the Enlightenment as you did. So I think that uh, I, I would want to say that uh, a lot of churches in the Global South, they are entering the Enlightenment. They have the benefit of hindsight as to the kind of mistakes we've made. Uh, I think that uh, if you are entering Enlightenment in a different way, you do experience the spirit world uh, more directly. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that that's a, a very good uh, 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 ground for the Christian faith to grow. John, hop in here. I was going to say with the Enlightenment, I mean, I, I guess it's, the jury is still out. I mean, uh, it's helped us in terms of quality of life, but uh, we also see the environmental impact that industrialization has had, etc. And also in the West, the division among Christians. And you mentioned, um, you know, divisions in church unity and fragmentation. I think there are parts of the Global South that could teach us a thing or two about unity. Because uh, I, I know certainly certain um, Asian theologians have said, well, to us in the global north, look, uh, you exported this divided Christianity to us. And um, in the Asian approach to religion, uh, it emphasizes unity. And uh, so there have been movements in Asia to kind of uh, say, well, this, these, d these denominations are not inherent to Christianity and are actually a Western phenomenon that you've exported to us. And so perhaps there's a, a more unified Christianity that might come from the global south. So take me into China. I mean, is there great unity amongst the Christian churches there? Well, uh, because of politics uh, in 1949 when the communist regime took over, the Protestant churches were merged together uh, into one kind of self, um, three self movement, three self church. They're under the government. Uh, and so in China, in China, either you're a Christian or a Catholic. So uh, <laughs> that, that's kind of hard for me to explain to some people. <laughs> but, uh, from, yeah. But anyway, from the official Chinese point of view, you're either Christian or Catholic or Muslim, etc. And so the, the Protestants, you could say, in China have already merged officially. Uh, I'm not talking about the underground churches. That's a whole other movement. Uh, but we see also in Japan um, uh, Japanese writers uh, like uh, Shusaku Endo who are trying to go back, wh whose thesis is Christianity is not originally a Western religion. That Christianity came from the Middle East and then was adopted uh, was infused with Greek philosophy and then Roman structure. Uh, and so people like Endo are trying to retrieve this non-Western Christianity that they think is more authentic to the original. Now, that's a very difficult enterprise, but it's quite interesting uh, to look at Christianity as something that was not originally Western, but that took on Western elements. So if you take Western culture out of Christianity, what do you have? And I think that's, a, that's the question that we're facing right now. Okay, so what do we have, Patrick, if we take Western civilization out of Christianity? I don't think that's possible. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I think that, uh, I just want to clarify, John, I, I didn't mean uh, yeah, no, enlightenment yeah. always is a good thing. Uh, on the other hand, I think that, you know, looking back at history, I'm not a professional like John, but I think that you, you, you always have both unity and diversity. And uh, commenting on, on, on the Chinese situation, um, I actually went to a church where they, uh, combined, they, they would have a kind of a Presbyterian service uh, for, for twice in the morning, a Pentecostal one in the afternoon, and an Anglican one in the evening. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, they tried to address uh, the diversity of background and taste as well. Uh, the, the people that I knew told me that 
with Seventh-day Adventists is a bit difficult. So, <laughs> so uh, they, they're working on that. And as a matter of fact, I think in China, uh, one of the uh, um, difficulties they have with underground churches and also with the growth is there is uh, some theological and spiritual practice that were completely outside Orthodox Christian belief, and there's no way for them to control it. So, the, so governance uh, in China is still a problem. John, what's in it for the government in China? I mean, why suddenly, I guess, are they at least allowing uh, some uh, official Christian churches? Well, what's in it for them? Well, basically, from the Chinese government point of view, uh, they're wary of anything that they cannot control. And that's why they're quite wary of groups like Falun Gong, because the leader can just send out an email, and all of a sudden, thousands of people are in a public place. And so similarly with the Christian churches, uh, they want churches that they can control. And that's been their approach since, 19, since 1949, early 50s. I hope, and maybe I know uh, Bishop Yu can jump in here and correct me, but I, I often wonder if with all the social displacement that's going on in China now, the migration of tens of millions of people from the countryside to the city, the largest movement in human history, whether the regime is going to start to see Christianity as a force for social stability. And uh, apparently there is, a, there is a bit of a renewal of Confucianism in China for this reason. And I often wonder, I mean, on one hand, the churches are there to challenge, um, especially regimes like an authoritarian communist regime. But I wonder if that regime will also see in the churches some force for social stability as well. Because I think that's going to become a, 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 a more pressing concern in China as China modernizes at such a hectic pace. Patrick, uh, John's wondering, do you have an answer for him? Uh, not an answer, but uh, com a complimentary uh, point. Uh, I think that when we were in Shanghai, the government, uh, the city government in Shanghai actually helped churches find places to build. Uh, and I mm. think that the, their official line would be that uh, after such economic growth, the agenda now is social stability, and they believe that the Christians yeah. have a contribution a co uh, together with other religions. So that's what's in it for yes. them. It depends on whether you believe that the Chinese government are sort of evil, or are they like any other government? They want to do some good. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jim, I want to ask you about your church. I'm going to pick on your church a little bit. I'm going to be honest here. Uh, many, many Christian denominations growing in the global south. Mennonites are not one of them that's growing exponentially. Does it make you nervous? Mennonites are growing in the global south. Very, but not as large as the other groups. No, we're a relatively small group. Uh, we will never match the, the size of Pentecostalism or, or Baptists or so on. So it's a relatively small group, although it has grown a great deal. It has probably within the last 30 years more than doubled. So that's, that's pretty significant growth. And, um, and it grows in relation to both of these factors that we've just been talking about. One, on the one hand, it is a force within society for you know, caring for the poor, uh, for a gospel of hope and reconciliation and so on, but it's also countercultural, and that's the other side which often makes governments uh, un uneasy. For example, when a few years ago when there was a major Mennonite assembly in Zimbabwe, I mean, that's a very tough place to bring in a global church which has got a tradition of peace and nonviolence and caring for the marginalized, and so one has to tread that carefully. So often governments want a force for morality and social um, stability, but they also recognize that the church is always been countercultural as well and that dynamic the church needs to keep. Glendon let me pick on your church for a bit not growing exponentially or as fast to say in China where which really is going to help define the quote-unquote new Christianity as we move forward does that make you nervous? Well I don't know how much it's not growing I can tell you that in the United States for example just one Baptist group Southern Baptists are 20, mil 20 million Southern Baptists in the United States so the church is growing in the north and in the south and I think that it will continue to grow simply because the label Baptist uh, does not appear. It doesn't mean that we don't hold, and hold to the core values and teachings of the scriptures. And that is why I keep referring to this, because when we talk about Christian, we can talk about Christianity as a religion that is a catch-all for all, for all kinds of groups with some variant of belief from the scriptures. Where, where we see as, evangel as evangelicals Christianity going, we see that as those who hold to the biblical paradosis. Uh, there's a content of doctrine that is handed to us. We are not shapers of that content. God gives us in scripture revelation of himself, of ourselves as sinners, and our need for salvation through faith in Christ. If there's a departure from that, 
we don't have Christianity. The Christianity may have an impact on society. It may change a society. It may improve people's lives. But the primary goal of Christianity is not social, but spiritual. And I think that where, that, where there is consistency and agreement with the scriptures, I think that there you have Christianity. And I think that Baptists, therefore, will be able to, to embrace others in the South who, who hold to the scriptures. Kevin, what worries you moving forward, if anything, ab about the, the influence of Christianity in the global South being more predominant sure. than the global North? I'm generally not too worried about too many things, but <laughs> when it comes to global... <laughs> you don't lose sleep over this I one. don't lose I mean, I think it's, it's phenomenally interesting. It is significant to developing countries or countries who are categorized as developing countries whose Christianity plays a key role in nation building in efforts at post-war reconciliation. These are some of the major themes in Latin America. And so I do... If, 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 if I am going to kind of worry, I, I would worry about the way that Christianity frames, for example, nation building or reconciliation or efforts at post-war security, for example, in Central America. So if we take kind of a, a very big bifurcation between, for example, the Catholic tradition in Latin America and the new forms of Christianity in Central America, you see very different um, assumptions about what it means to be human and what it means to participate um, in the public sphere. And so... Sure, I could worry. Um, I could find inspiration with the liberation theology background of Latin America, though it has, is not as loud as the Pentecostal emphasis on leadership or self-esteem or motivation that, that you see in Latin America. So I think if worried about anything, it would be how these major processes get framed by Christianity. Okay, we have about uh, five, seven minutes left. I want to just uh, bring this conversation home. Uh, John, let me begin with you. As white people are becoming increasingly secular and as the rest of the world converts to Christianity, how do you think all this influence is going to change Christianity here at home in Canada? I think it's going to bring some life to it. <laughs> and uh, it, it can, um, as, as has been pointed out already, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in the church in Quebec. Uh, of course, the Catholic Church there had the Quiet Revolution. And one of my recent trips to Montreal, I walked by a church that was packed. And people were singing. I walked in, and it was, it was a Haitian um, revival weekenders. And these were charismatic Catholics. The church was packed. And the, um, uh, the, um, the, the, the white Quebecers were all kind of looking in curiously. They'd never seen this before. So um, I, I think the, uh, I'm not, I don't worry about this at all. I think it's actually a very good thing. And it's something that the church leaders and the church faithful as a whole have to get on board with and embrace the change. I think it's going to bring a lot of life. It's going to bring new perspectives that the North has never thought of. It's going to raise issues of justice. As earlier commentator said, the church is not just spiritual. Uh, the spirituality uh, causes us to take action in the social sphere, especially towards social justice. And I think if people are sincere about their faith in this way, I think uh, there's a, a tremendous potential here for um, revival and, and new life in the church. Okay, Glenn, and I should apologize. Obviously, we're not talking about white people. We're talking about the global north. We have two gentlemen at the table who aren't white, so there you go. Apologies to everyone for that. But, Glenn, do you see the church in Canada changing as a result of the influence of the Global South Church? I think it's going to, the church will always reflect the society, ethnic makeup of the society. And I think that's wonderful because it does tell us that in Jesus Christ, we are one. And that's what's going to be represented in the years to come. Jim, see changes ahead for us? Yes, I think there are changes ahead, and uh, the changes in, in leadership, the changes in where ideas will come from. So much now is still from the English-speaking world gets translated into other languages. Um, for the Mennonite uh, Church, for example, uh, Cesar Garcia is the new head of the Mennonite Communion worldwide. He's from Colombia. That's the first time uh, that the person has had that particular leadership role from, from that part of the world. And from a country, by the way, which is still torn by violence in many, many places. So he reflects that as he moves around and, and communicates. So I think the visible leadership, where ideas will come from, where the agenda is set, I think will be much more diverse. And I think in, in our own setting, that will be very enriching, even though at first we'll feel more like other people did, saying, where are those ideas coming from? Whose agenda is that? We, those are normal human things. But I think there's a sense of vitality, too, in the church life. Um, I, I'm very, very hopeful, but I am quite aware that there's another possibility, and that is that as the dynamism shifts to other places, people here who used to be more in charge may actually lose interest. And one of the things about the missionary movement that happened, when missionaries stopped going, we're no longer in certain countries, it took a long time before people re-engaged with an interest in what was happening in those countries. And I would hope that we can keep a kind of global connection. That'll be really, really important for us to be influenced by it.
Uh, I have similar concerns. I think that uh, it would change us in many ways. I think it, it, it's a wake-up call. I think that our church has been losing the nerve and thinking that it's a dying proposition. I think what's happening in Global South is that it ain't so. Uh, so I think that we are learning that we need to engage, we need to tell others about uh, the faith rather than just sit back and w w wait for them to come in. But a concern is that we want to keep the uh, directions uh, flowing both ways. I think it would be very sad if the South write us off and stop learning uh, the kind of uh, experience that we've had, and it would be very sad if we don't listen to the vitality that's there. But, but the message has traditionally, anyway, been one way. We sent missionaries there. Now we're seeing the reverse trend. They're coming mm. here. And, and John, let me ask you, I mean, is that a positive thing? Are we going to embrace this? I mean, Jim raised some, you know, not sure. We'll have to see how this plays out concerns. Yeah, in my th enthusiasm for globalization, I don't mean to gloss over the challenges. I mean, right here in Saskatchewan, uh, I think a majority of our, our diocesan priests now are from the developing world. There are, there's a lack of priests coming from here, and so um, our bishop has to go over and recruit priests in Vietnam, Philippines, and India. There's a challenge because they also uh, come with uh, cultural ideas. The culture here has their own ideas, and sometimes they clash on issues like involvement of the laity, involvement of women, um, uh, democracy, um, uh, just the role of the priest. In, in some of these cultures, the role of priest in the Catholic Church is quite... Uh, uh, an elevated one, whereas in North American culture we've gotten used to priests now be playing more of a spiritual role um, and more of a democratization occurring. So it, it is fraught with challenges. Um, and so, um, yes, we are receiving missionaries from the developing world. And it, I, I'm interested to see how this develops. I think if, for those who do come here, like the missionaries who went to the Global South, really they had to be trained. They had to be educated in anthropology, in history, in politics, in language, to understand those cultures they're going into. Because if you're not, you're liable to commit horrific mistakes, as we've seen. Are you concerned about the reverse missionaries coming into Canada and in the Global North? Not, not at all. Uh, no, no, not, not concerned at all. I, I do think it's, a, it's an incredible development. Well-organized, well-funded missionary movements from what we've been calling the Global South coming here to North America. Uh, will probably spark some pretty significant cultural and social changes. Kevin said at the beginning that you, you thought uh, we might hit a saturation point. If we're having this conversation, Patrick, if five, ten years from now, what's going to be the most important feature if we see, as we see Christianity around the world? I, I can't tell you because I don't uh, practice looking into the future. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, you want to take a crack at that? Well, I'm, I'm not sure uh, either what it'll be, although I think we're all going to be much more aware of the variety and yet the unity, and I think that's going to be a great, great gift. John, I'm going to give you the last word because you're in my home province of Saskatchewan. Oh, good. <laughs> I didn't know you're from here. Um, you know what my hope is, Pia? My hope is that we will live what one of the early church fathers said, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, diversity, and in all things, charity. Okay, we'll leave it at that. Thank you to you all. Happy Easter to you all, by the way. Thanks for coming in on this Easter Monday. John Meehan from Campion College at the University of Regina. Uh, here in studio, Patrick Yu, Anglican Area Bishop from York Scarborough, and Glendon Thompson, Toronto Baptist Seminary and Bible College, Jim Pankratz from the Conrad Grable University College at the University of Waterloo, and Kevin O'Neill from the University of Toronto. Thanks again. Happy Easter. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.